Hello? Okay. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for joining our, our first world uh, highlight session titled The International Cooperation on Space Exploration. I'm Masa Miyake, uh, Director of the uh, International Relations Department of JAXA, and uh, today's moderator for this session. Uh, space exploration is a very hot topic in the world right now. For example, the, uh, right after this session, uh, some members uh, have to go to Beijing to attend another some global uh, exploration conference. And also, there, as Dr. Okumura mentioned at his opening speech, uh, Japanese government will host the second International Space Exploration Forum, or ICEF-2, uh, March next year. So uh, space exploration should be a global endeavor among the worldwide communities and application of innovative technology would be critical element towards uh, our uh, challenging mission. So this session, uh, has, uh, we have the core member from the uh, International Space Education, uh, Exploration Coordination Group, or ISEC-Z, as uh, panelist. So I would like today ask the, uh, the pan panelists to share the, the major program, and uh, then uh, we like to exchange some views uh, regarding the how international cooperation uh, will be critical towards our common goals. So let me introduce the uh, today's speaker and the panelist from uh, right to left. So Ms. Cassie Lonini, a senior advisor of the exploration and the, uh, space, uh, space operation of NASA. Thank you, Cassie. And, uh, Mr. Bernardo Hüffenbach, Head of Strategic Planning and uh, Outreach Office from ESA. Thank you, Bernardo. And Mr. Naoki Sato, Senior Engineer of the HTB Project Team of JAXA, and uh, he's the rep of the uh, ISAC T. Thank you. And Dr. Nicholas Reinke, uh, he's the Director of the DRO Tokyo Office. Thank you, Julian. And Mr. Pierre Henry Pisani, Counselor for uh, Space Affairs, Embassy of France, and working with CNES. Thank you, Pisani san. So, first, uh, for the uh, audience uh, who are not so familiar with the ISEC Z and also some international effort on the space exploration, I'd like to introduce some outline uh, briefly. So, ISEC Z is the uh, uh, performing a technical study and uh, international collaborative the space exploration among the space agency. Right now, the, uh, we have the uh, uh, 15 agency, uh, including uh, Italian space agency and Chinese space agency, Canada and uh, East, uh, Indian, and uh, Korea, South Korea, and the Los Coast and so on. And today uh, we have five uh, representatives from the uh, member of the ISEC-D. And uh, uh, right now the uh, uh, NASA take uh, uh, the uh, chairmanship of this ISEC-D. And uh, one of the uh, uh, some uh, important effort from from the ISEC G the, to developing the global exploration the roadmap uh, GR uh, since uh, 2010, and uh, right now the second version of the GR was issued uh, in uh, published in 2013. I like to some uh, uh, current uh, global explorations uh, roadmap that's uh, uh, to show the some 
over all the uh, some mission scenario towards the uh, moon and Mars and uh, uh, so beyond the lower orbit. So this uh, uh, roadmap shows that the lowest orbit should be utilized to the some gateway for the uh, future the beyond lowest orbit uh, space exploration. Also, also the lunar density, the uh, some critical uh, capability or to develop some our technology towards the uh, human uh, Mars mission. And so uh, also the, we have the uh, uh, Mars uh, program here. So kind of this step by step, the approach will be very important uh, with the international cooperation. So we identified several some capability or asset or the infrastructure to achieve this uh, mission scenario. And uh, some uh, mission uh, or project was already uh, planned and some was not planned. So I think that we have the, some current ongoing the status from the, uh, each panelist today. Also in the future, so we still need some more innovative technology uh, for the, uh, our endeavor towards the lunar and uh, Mars. So the, uh, we also can discuss about the, some, what uh, technology is critical for the future, our exploration program. For example, in the uh, uh, lunar program, as you can see this chart, so many different countries to have their uh, aggressive the effort to go the lunar uh, surface uh, to uh, investigate uh, some uh, scientific objective and also the some resources like uh, water and so on. So we should uh, collaborate more efficiently to get some uh, good outcome from this mission. Okay, that's all uh, my first uh, opening this, uh, session. And uh, lastly, I'd like to show some uh, future of uh, endeavor. Okay, now I'd like to uh, ask the Ms. Uh, Kelsey to, to, to present the uh, NASA's the status for the human uh, space exploration. So please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Miyaki-san, and thank you for uh, the invitation to be here. I'm very pleased to be here and, and share with you the status of our human space exploration planning activity. Mm. So uh, just as a way to set the stage, uh, this chart reflects our, our overall goal, which is to uh, lead an international effort to expand human presence deeper into the solar system through a sustainable human and robotic spaceflight program. I include this chart because it's, uh, it reflects really policy that's established within the United States, this expanding human presence into the solar system. So we have a, a strong foundation and government support for the kinds of uh, programs that we're working on and the missions that I will be describing in this presentation. Um, this is a picture of the surface of Mars taken by the Curiosity rover shortly after it landed. You can see, this is the Gale Crater, and you can see uh, Mount Sharp in, in the distance on the right. Uh, Mars is, our, is really our, our driving and, and horizon destination for the human spaceflight program. Uh, getting humans to the surface of Mars has significant cultural and, and scientific significance. Um, the first humans on another planet sets the stage for, uh, for expanding the, the presence of, of our species beyond, beyond Earth, and that will be uh, of huge cultural significance. But scientifically, Mars is often called our, our sister planet. Uh, it, it had an atmosphere once millions of years ago, and now um, most of that, uh, that atmosphere has eroded. And, and why is that? Um, we, with curiosity, we've confirmed 
uh, the presence, uh, the likely presence of neutral water in the past, and uh, what happened to it? Were there, uh, were, was there life supported uh, on, on the planet in the past? Is there life there today? So some of these scientific questions are, are among the highest priority scientific questions in the, in the planetary science community. So getting humans to the surface of Mars will be a huge, uh, a huge step in answering many of those questions. And we, we use Mars as a driving goal because, you know, you'll hear me talk about sustainability, but as we invest in the near-term capabilities to explore uh, the, the solar system, uh, we want to, with each investment, each step of the way, make sure that our investments are, are taking us one step closer to putting humans on the surface of Mars. So we, we've established a series of, uh, a set of strategic principles that guide our planting, planning, and they're listed here. Uh, I'll, I'll touch on a couple of them, but, but fiscal realism is important. You know, during the Apollo period, the Apollo program, NASA's budget was, was 5% of, of, the, of the GDP, and we won't see those kinds of budgets going forward. We, don't, we won't be asking for those kinds of budgets. Um, we have a significant, we're, we're lucky to have a significant budget not only supporting the International Space Station program, but in, in developing exploration capabilities. And we see being able to lead this exploration endeavor um, with, with, with the budget we have, commensurate with, with, with growth um, uh, of the budget, uh, uh, commensurate, let's say, with economic growth in the country. Uh, the importance of scientific exploration, you know, human, human exploration, uh, is not really justified by, by scientific goals, but it won't be successful if, if human space exploration doesn't understand the important scientific priorities of the science community and, and work to achieve them. Uh, architecture openness and resilience. What this means is recognizing that there are, um, there are many nations around the globe that want to be part of an international exploration endeavor. The ISS partner agencies are the ones um, most uh, actively working to enable this future, but there are many other nations, as mentioned by Miyakisan, participating in the ISEG that also want to be part of it. So we need to, uh, we welcome all, we welcome the contributions from everyone, and and need to develop an architecture that enables those contributions, and and global cooperation and leadership. We talk, I will talk a little bit about partnerships in the future, but these missions won't happen without partnerships, um, both international and with the with the private sector. Uh, so this chart represents our, our vision for space exploration. You can see on the left-hand side the International Space Station. It plays a critical role in, in enabling human space exploration. And you see Mars, as I mentioned, as our, as our driving destination. <coughs> and at the top you can see how the steps that, that we envision. Um, now we're doing a lot of things on the ISS, which I'll talk about in, in, the, in a minute. But uh, in the 2020s, with the SLS and Orion, we will have a presence in this, this in the area around the moon, and perhaps even on the surface of the moon. But this, these operations in the lunar vicinity, which is a, a deep space environment, the radiation environment, um, in increasing distance from from Earth, it's, it it'll enable us to to understand the risks and, and mitigate the risks of, of human exploration beyond the Earth-Moon system. We're pretty comfortable in low Earth orbit right now, but uh, missions beyond the Earth-Moon system represent challenges that uh, we can only begin to understand how to address. And this area around the Moon will enable us to, to make progress in preparing for the missions beyond. And then after 2030, we envision sending crews beyond the Earth-Moon system, uh, initially to Mars orbit, and, and then to the surface of Mars. And, and the capabilities we have will enable us to, to visit asteroids in their native orbit should, that, uh, should, that be, uh, should there be opportunities and, and interest. So we envision, and across the bottom you see fa a phased approach. So uh, phase zero right now is, the, is ongoing on board the ISS, doing the research necessary to prepare to solve the exploration challenges. Then the first phase, which I'll talk a lot more about in the future, is these missions in cislunar space to establish what we're calling a deep space gateway. Yaki-san showed a picture of it, and I'll describe that. Um, after, after that, we'll have, begin to construct the transport, the human space, deep space transport, we call it, but this is the, the vehicle that will, will take astronauts beyond the Earth-Moon system towards Mars. And then, uh, and then once the, those, this period of time in the lunar vicinity is We've, once we've mitigated the risks and understand, have the reliable systems that we need, then we'll go beyond 
uh, towards, towards, uh, towards Mars. So the International Space Station. The International Space Station is just a critical, uh, critical part of our exploration program. It's not only, only that, but it is the, uh, an incredible facility in low Earth orbit. The research that's being done both by governments and, and, and non-government entities, private sector and entities now, is, is significant. Um, we are doing research that's not only preparing for exploration, but is, um, is uh, uh, addressing fundamental physical sciences and biological sciences questions, the kind of things that bring new insights into, uh, into uh, uh, that affect processes and, and products here on Earth. Uh, and then we have research that's funded by the private sector, which is uh, research and activities. You know, what the ISS has done in the last several years is, is become a platform where entrepreneurs can investigate business models around making money uh, with humans and human infrastructure in space. And a lot of exciting things are going on on board the space station right now. The, the commercial crew and cargo transportation capability programs that we have are, are demonstrating um, not only that the future can be a, 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 commercial, uh, a commercial future in low Earth orbit, the, the economic development of low Earth orbit, if you will, is, is well underway. And, and the, the research and the activities on board the space station are, are driving the, uh, the, 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 uh, the demand side of the equation, if you will. And this is a picture of the SLS in Orion. So the SLS, the Space Launch System, is our heavy lift, heavy lift launcher. And sitting atop of it is the Orion capsule. Um, the first flight of this system will be an unmanned flight in, in 2019. And, and then that will be followed with, with a manned flight uh, early next decade and a series, of, a series of missions at least once a year uh, to the lunar vicinity. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it. But the, the, the work to, um, to assemble and prepare for the first two flights is, is, is proceeding very well in the U.S. So here's some pictures of, of the Orion uh, crew capsule assembly. You can see um, technicians preparing uh, avionics systems. You can see the, the uh, thermal protection system for the first mission is already installed and, um, and, and prepared. You can see the flight hardware for the first First e EM-1 mission, we call it, coming together at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The service module for the Orion is being built in Europe, and the work on that continues, continues uh, at, a, at a quick pace. The full mock-up of the a full test unit of the Orion is present in our Denver facility and undergoing testing with the crew module. The flight hardware for the first flight is coming together in Bremen and will be shipped to, to the U.S. Uh, uh, next year for integration on the first flight. Uh, on the space launch system, here's a picture of, of the upper stage that will be used to boost the Orion to its, uh, to its orbit. It's called the in interim cryogenic propulsion stage because it's based on, uh, it's only used in the first flight, the first test flight, um, the uncrewed test flight, and it's based on a Delta IV upper stage. But this is the flight unit for the first flight, and it's already at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, here's a, some nice pictures of the of the core stage of the SLS hydrogen tank. You know, it's a it's a huge tank, uh, 160 feet tall, holds about over 500,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen. What you can see is two technicians in there preparing the the uh, the, the tank for its delivery to Marshall Space Flight Center. This is this is a, a structural qualification test article that's uh, at Marshall Space Flight Center now undergoing testing just to ensure that the, that the design meets the requirements. Uh, so with the, with the SLS and Orion, uh, the first flight uh, in 2019, the uncrewed flight I mentioned, the, the next flight will be a, a manned flight, and with that we will have the capability to co-manifest a payload on the space launch system, on the SLS. So the SLS will carry not only the Orion, but a co-manifested payload of up to 10 metric tons. And so our vision is to use the SLS and the Orion in, in early next decade to assemble what we're calling the Deep Space Gateway. And this is intended to be a, a small international art, art infrastructure 
uh, around the moon. We're talking with our, with our partners about how we can realize this small infrastructure together. The idea of this gateway is to establish a, a small infrastructure around the, the, the orbit of the moon that will enable us initially to, um, to send astronauts there and start to uh, test technologies in the deep space environment, test the layouts for new habitation systems that will ultimately be employed sending astronauts to Mars, do science of the moon and, and, uh, and of the Earth and of deep space, uh, and, and, and prepare this facility uh, as a provider of, of services to not only um, our future uh, Mars missions, but also perhaps private sector activities that will take place around the, uh, around the moon. So the Deep Space Gateway will be, assembly will begin early next decade and, and astronaut flights to it will begin immediately. And uh, phase two then will be focused on us, for us the assembly and check out of what we're calling the Deep Space Transport. This is the, uh, an, uh, an image, an artist concept, so don't, don't get too married to the design here, but the idea is to uh, assemble the spacecraft that will ultimately take crews beyond the Earth-Moon system towards the two Mars, uh, and uh, and in the lunar vicinity, we want to we want to assemble and prepare the spacecraft, take it on a shakedown cruise, if you will, ensure the reliability of of the life support systems and the other systems that will keep the crew um, keep the crew alive and safe on the way to Mars. You know, we won't have for these missions to Mars, we won't have the robust logistics supply system that we have on board, have supporting the International Space Station. So we have to improve the reliability and the efficiency of the systems that we have today. Uh, and so the, the phase two will be focused on the assembly of this deep space transport and, and preparing for Mars. Uh, the, the gateway itself is a great infrastructure for supporting human lunar surface missions. Um, what you'll hear about in, in subsequent presentations today is how how human missions to the surface of the moon can benefit from the presence of an infrastructure in the lunar vicinity. It enables reusable, reusable transportation architectures. It enables an architecture that is very um, uh, representative of the architecture we'll use to explore the surface of Mars in the future. So there's, there's much that can be gained um, taking advantage of this deep space gateway infrastructure. So uh, that gives you a, a flavor of, of what we're working on and how excited we are for, for the future. And uh, I'll, I'll stop there. OK. Thank you, Cassie, uh, for the very aggressive and very broad on your strategy for the future. OK, next speaker is Mr. Bernardo Huchenbach. And uh, he might show some video first and to present later. So please start. So I thought better than describing our program, I show a few images of our program. 
What I would like to present is really our exploration, space exploration envelope program. And since the last ministerial meeting, we have in Europe every three, three years, so since about 2016, we have in Europe a single exploration program which integrates all our robotic and human exploration activities. And what you have just seen was a summary of how our program looks today. This is a rather busy slide, but it shows you really what our program of strategy looks like. You see on the, on the left side, you see the key element of our exploration program. There are four main blocks. One is the ISS, which is still the centerpiece of our program. We are contributing, as was mentioned before, the service module to the space transportation system of NASA. Uh, and we are also participating in a mission together with Russia to send a, a mission to the lunar surface by 2020. It's called the Lunar Resource Mission. And we are implementing the ExoMars program, also in cooperation with Russia and with another contribution. And you've seen highlights of these four elements in the videos just shown. What is on the right side is where we want to go. We want to be partner in ex sustained exploitation of LEO platforms. We really want to be a partner in the early human missions beyond lower orbit, making use of the Deep Space Gateway, which was introduced before. Our vision is to send humans to the lunar surface and a long-term humans to, the, to, to Mars. And in the middle, you see what we're really focusing on in terms of preparing the future. We are thinking about two different scenarios for continuing after ISS. So we do discuss with the Chinese manned space agencies to secure access to European scientists and astronauts to the Chinese station. We are also looking at opportunities to build up commercial partnerships for post-ISS and try to position our industry in what's probably an international market. Uh, we have an intent to continue contrib contributing to the Orion beyond our first two service models for the first unmanned and manned mission. And together with contribution to the steep, Deep Space Gateway, we want to be partner in what is called the early human mission scenario beyond low Earth orbit. In order to prepare for human lunar exploration, we're currently looking at two kind of demonstration missions to follow our collaboration with Russia. And we are heavily interested in participating in what is likely another led Mars sample return campaign. Now what you see on top is the way how we will explore for us, we more and more try to integrate human and robotic exploration capabilities. That's where also we develop an integrated program, which is both integrating human spaceflight and robotics. We are seeking for international commercial partnership because we do everything in space exploration through partnerships. We don't have any autonomous activities. Uh, we are very much looking forward to integrate space exploration with society to really show how exploration benefits society on Earth. And in terms of technology focus, we are very much focusing on creating innovative capabilities for human operations in space. So we are not so much focusing maybe on deep space transportation or uh, other capabilities, but we have a strong focus on human operations in space. And as we're doing this, we're trying to increasingly exploit synergies between the different destinations and different missions we are implementing. Now, since very short time, we have actually now the full funding approved to de de deliver our contributions to our collaboration with Russia for a landing on moon, moon surface by 2020. Uh, we have two key contributions. One contribution is, is a prospecting payload, including a drill, which is meant to assess lunar polar volatiles. We also provide a precision landing system to enable landing in a polar region, which is far more challenging. And we also provide ground support support for this consecutive lunar missions. So with this, by now, really, we have an approved lunar program. We had for long plans for lunar exploration, but now we have the funding committed to actually deliver the equipment and deliver them to Roscosmos in due time. In terms of LEO platforms, as I said earlier, we are focusing now on trying to assess what will happen after ISS and lowers orbit. We do believe ISS is an excellent platform, and we do hope that we can continue using it well beyond 2024. But we think it's time to think about what happens after ISS because of the technical lifetime limitation. And we strongly believe also in the idea of creating commercial or public-private partnerships uh, where maybe ag agencies act more as a partner and customer rather than owner and operator of future facilities. And we have just released last week an announcement opportunity on co-funded studies for post-IS platforms where we invite our industries to come forward with proposals driven by business plans and we very much welcome international partnership in this undertaking, so we look forward to industry, to industry collaboration beyond Europe. We, as I said earlier, want to engage in early human missions beyond lowest orbit. You see another conceptual image of the Deep Space Gateway with another transportation system attached to it. 
So we are currently heavily engaging in the studies which are conducted under NASA leadership in the ISS partnership to define the mission, to define the infrastructure and this deep space gateway and we have various potential interests in providing significant contribution to the deep space gateway as well as to the continued production of the uh, ESM as well as the, the Orion as well as evolution which would enable us to become a real partner in this undertaking in, in the years to come. Um, we are very much interested to link this deep space gateway to human lunar surface missions and since early of this year we, we will actually have decided to focus our lunar exploration activities post our lunar resource mission collaboration with Russia on two kind of missions. The first one is a mission where we want to demonstrate the selected in situ resource utilization process, very much focusing on producing oxygen and water on the moon. And our intent is to enable that through primarily commercial but also international partnership. And we will release another announcement opportunity regarding this mission before the summer break. And then we intend to develop a proposal for full funding of this mission at the time for our next decision milestone, which is 2019. We are also working in close collaboration with JAXA, CSA, and with support of NADA now since three years on a mission concept which would demonstrate human lunar service operations by demonstrating key technologies, concept operations, and basically simulated a human mission utilizing Deep Space Gateway and thereby preparing really for future partnership of starting a human lunar service campaign. And this mission also by demonstrating return capabilities, uh, return some precious samples. So our intent is to further advance this mission concept and enter a what we call phase A, mission definition phase, early this year in order to also prepare a decision how we actually can go from a conceptual study to a serious plan to develop such a mission further in international partnership. And we hope that the mission could be realized any time between 25 to 2030. As said earlier, Mars sample return is a key interest for us. This chart shows the, the Mars sample return mission architecture as defined by NASA. Uh, we have a strong interest to engage in this post ExoMars. Our second mission of ExoMars deploying a lander will happen in 2020. So we would like to become a partner in two consecutive missions. There is a planning to deploy another NASA orbiter for telecommunication in 22, 24, and we would like to provide a contribution. Uh, there are also plans to then actually implement the Mars sample return mission either in 26, 28. Again, we would like to make contribution, and generally, our contribution shall focus on mastering sample acquisition, handling, return, and analysis. And you see what we're really interested in is to provide a biosealing bio system for the NASA NEMO orbiter. We're interested in the return leg of the samples, including the Earth's return capsule. We're interested in providing a sample fetch rover, and of course, we're interested in assessing samples back here on Earth. Next to our core mission I just represented, we are very much open for partnerships and we're looking for mission opportunities which, which are not led by us, but where we make meaningful contribution. And mission of opportunities can be enabled through international partnership or commercial partnerships. So do, we do engage with, with partners to, to contribute to their missions, primarily to advance scientific and technology objectives, but also secure additional astronaut missions. So, for example, we do discuss quite intensively with the Chinese Main Space Administration to see whether we can send a European astronaut to the Chinese Main Space Station by 2023, including, of course, a utilization package. We have various concepts of private sector-led lunar missions for telecommunication services, for lending, and we try to understand whether ESA, as a business partner, can enable this mission to nurture also a private sector economy in Europe. And we are making quite some progress, in particular, on some of these private sector missions. So we hope we see some of these missions realized in, in the next five years. I was asked to speak about Moon Village, and here I've taken some slides from our DG. You know that the ESA DG promotes the Moon Village concept now since quite a while. And actually, Moon Village for him is directly connected to what, what he called Space 4.0. You see on the slide that uh, Space 4.0 is based on shifts of paradigm, so there are new motivation for space exploration. We see new actors. Today we have institutional space, we have more and more commercial space, but now we also have philanthropic space, and all these actors have different motivation, different funding sources to explore. Uh, that different roles of our partners, we have disruptive technologies, so the Moon Village concept is nothing else than a concept which demonstrates how Space 4.0 can enable a new phase of space exploration. 
And this small village concept, I think ESA intends to further advance this concept, but not as an agency, but together with all partners, institutional and non-institutional, who are interested in this. We see it really like a vision which drives also our activities. So if you think back about what I presented earlier, our lunar activities, whether it's participating in the early human missions to assist lunar space, the, the mission together with Russia to, to land on the surface and prospect for in situ resources, the two demonstration mission, again, for demonstrating in situ resources or demonstrating how we can, humans, can humans can access lunar surface, are all meant to prepare for future where we maybe see indeed sustained activities on the lunar surface. As we are exploring, one thing becomes more and more important to us, as I said earlier, one of our goals is to integrate space exploration with society. And the way we do it, we try to show more and more how what we do in space benefits people here on Earth. And we have basically now a, a new scheme in place where before we make any proposals for the funding decision, we conduct what we call an ex ante uh, benefit assessment to show really how we not only create scientific outcomes, new technologies, but also we can innovate uh, processes and technologies for terrestrial applications. We are doing that very much by using the sustainable development goals as a, a, a basically reference. And we started to develop a platform on the internet, which you can see here, there's an internet address, where we will publish not only our assessment of future activities, but we also will publish regular success stories of what we are already achieving today. No, that doesn't work anymore. I have, let's see, I have one more slide. I just wanted to mention that we have just, a few days ago, one of our astronauts returned from the station, uh, Thomas Pesky. He had a very successful mission, and he had a lot of followers on social media. It was extremely successful. Um, and one reason why we do space exploration is inspiration. And I think he can express in much better words how what he's doing inspires him and society. And that's why I would like to end my presentation with another little movie. Also, I wonder who I am and who I'm going to be. One may think it's hard to focus on yourself in such a different context, a context out of this world. Well, it's not. It comes quite natural indeed. Who am I? A spaceman? A French astronaut? No, I'm a man together with other men and women on a trip of discovery. And like every trip, it leads to discover yourself more than other places. And for some reason, it takes all of this technology for us to come up here and understand the simplicity of things. The Earth, the cosmos, and life itself as a unity. And from here, it's really difficult to understand borders, wars, and hate. Sometimes, these thoughts are a bit overwhelming. At least until you go to sleep again. Thank you very much, Bernardo. Uh, I really understand that uh, many different types of the international cooperation has now been conducted by ESA. Okay, uh, next speaker is uh, Mr. Naoki Sato. Uh, he will present the uh, JAXA's uh, initiative for this space exploration. Thank you very much. I'm Naoki Sato, JAXA. Uh, did I talk about the JAXA's vision for the space exploration? Uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have a, a cool nickname such as the Journey to Mars mm -hmm. of NASA or uh, Moon Village of ESA. 
So I'd like to hear a uh, solicit for the nickname, <laughs> cool nickname for the Japanese uh, vision for the space exploration. So uh, if you could uh, please send that, uh, your proposal for the nickname uh, afterward. Anyway, I'd like to uh, talk about the uh, vision, uh, which is the uh, why and where and how and so on. So I'd like to touch on those things. Uh, first of all, the objectives of space exploration is very important. I think that there are many ways to describe the objectives of the space exploration, but uh, uh, we simplify it to the two uh, categorization, which is the science and the habitation. Uh, science is also for the, uh, the seek for the new uh, knowledge, uh, which will, uh, will, will result in the uh, will see an intellectual life. And habitation is exploit uh, new land, and uh, this is for the uh, expanding uh, humankind's uh, territory. And uh, between this, uh, we have some scientific exploration using the human ability. And uh, this is a, a goal, uh, kind of the uh, where we, need, we should go. So the, uh, as uh, similar to the NASA and the ESA, the ultimate goal uh, for the international partners will be the uh, Mars, but uh, in Japan, I would, would like to uh, focus on the uh, moon exploration, uh, such as the uh, lunar orbit mission and also the uh, lunar surface missions. And uh, the target uh, will be the uh, uh, several hundred days in the lunar vicinity or lunar, lunar orbit. Uh, and also the uh, uh, several hundreds uh, on the surface mission. Uh, this, these are for the uh, preparation for the uh, ultimate goal of Mars exploration. And this is uh, the, still Jackson's proposal, not the Japan, Japan's uh, idea, but the uh, overall architecture for this uh, lunar exploration, uh, starting for the, uh, from, the, uh, from the Earth and uh, the I think the next step should be the deep space gateway uh, proposed by NASA and other international partners. And then the, uh, the, the final step should be the lunar surface exploration. And uh, uh, in, in this uh, uh, architecture, the water is a key uh, of the, this architecture. So we, we are not sure about the, uh, how, how abundant water will be uh, in the lunar surface, but if there is some uh, abundant uh, water on the lunar surface, we can uh, uh, draw uh, this kind of architecture, utilizing the uh, water to the fuel uh, with the fuel uh, plant, and also the uh, uh, reusable lunar lander using that uh, fuel from the water. So the, uh, the, the deep, deep space gateway will be the uh, anchorage uh, of the uh, reusable lander and uh, uh, also the, uh, within the, this architecture we can do a, a comprehensive uh, uh, lunar exploration uh, and uh, lunar scientific uh, exploration. And uh, in this architecture, we, uh, for the crew transportation, we'll be uh, relied on the SLS and Orion maybe uh, Russian ones, and, uh, but uh, for the other uh, part, such as the uh, deep, uh, deep space gateway and uh, lunar lander or pressurized rover and the fuel plant, uh, could be uh, uh, other international uh, partners' contribution. And uh, towards the, the uh, such kind of the architecture of objectives, uh, the, we need some uh, near-term uh, focuses. And uh, as a next uh, uh, subcommittee, uh, which is the uh, International uh, ISS and the International Space Exploration Subcommittee, published the second uh, interim report uh, two years ago. And the key suggestion in, the, in that report uh, for the near-term activities uh, are the, uh, the lunar south pole exploration, including water prospect, and the uh, uh, fourth technology area to be advanced will be the uh, landing technology and exploration technology and the habitation technology, including close across and the technology for deep space uh, logistics. Uh, so now we are focusing on this technology development and also the uh, uh, water prospecting mission. Okay, so uh, for the water prospect 
Shipping Mission, uh, still under study at JAXA. The target launch date will be uh, uh, 2022 timeframe, and the landing site will be the uh, long sunlit uh, area, but uh, just adjacent to the possible abundant water area. So as, as you can see in the right hand side, this is uh, the uh, analysis result uh, by the league. Uh, the blue area is uh, the, the water abundant area uh, with some uh, condition. So the, uh, actually this uh, area is around the 5,000 uh, square kilometers, so it's very wide area. So I think uh, if there is some abundant water in this area, we can uh, utilize for many uh, missions uh, in the future. Uh, but uh, this is still a wide area, so uh, only the uh, single nation can uh, do the uh, whole uh, or th uh, thorough uh, exploration, so we need some uh, international co uh, cooperation or cooperation. And for the, uh, the technology area, the, the one of the uh, key technology we'd like to uh, contribute to this uh, international space exploration is uh, ICRUS. And uh, this busy chart shows our ICRUS uh, concept, which uh, consists of the air recycle system and the water re uh, recovery system and the waste management system. And our goal is to the, uh, for the uh, supply free for uh, water and uh, oxygen. And uh, uh, this, uh, many people may, uh, may not uh, consider that this is uh, uh, true, but uh, Actually, the, uh, we have uh, water or uh, oxygen in our food so that uh, we can uh, extract those uh, water and oxygen, even if the uh, water recycle, uh, recovery system water or the air recycle system uh, is not 100% uh, efficiency, but uh, we can, uh, even with the uh, 59 or uh, 55 or 50, 6% uh, efficiency of this system, uh, we can uh, be a supply free uh, for water or oxygen. And also the, uh, the another key feature of our system is the uh, uh, water recycle by electrolysis. Uh, this uh, contributes the uh, resource uh, mitigation such as power and volume and weight. And uh, finally, uh, this is a the JAXA vision of the uh, future lunar exploration uh, the, for the full-fledged uh, lunar utilization and science exploration using the uh, fuel plant and reusable, reusable uh, lambda or hopper. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Sato-san. Uh, as a research and development agency of Japan, uh, yeah, we JAXA was studying the, some, you know, feasibility for the, to using the you know, surface for the future exploration. Okay, and uh, uh, I'd like to use the uh, remaining uh, 30 minutes for the, some panel discussion and including some questions from the floor. Uh, first, the, uh, I think that nobody doubt the international cooperation is uh, necessary for the uh, future exploration mission. And ISS is uh, uh, one of the very successful the uh, international cooperation, cooperation mission uh, to have the uh, some uh, uh, good uh, outcome the at the uh, Takuya Onishi's presentation and uh, some panelists' presentation. So I like to ask the uh, uh, Mr. Lainke, uh this, you know you DRR is a member of the ESA and also the. Uh, 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 promoting some the uh, experiment in ISS and also you uh, supporting some our uh, Hayabusa to the mission. Uh, so could you explain uh, what's going on uh, in, the, in the DRR for the ISS activity and the future exploration? Yes, thank you so much uh, for the question. Um, yes, of course, I mean, DLR at, as the uh, German Aerospace Center, we of course part of uh, ESA. Um, and so uh, with a contribution to ESA, we, we join all these uh, projects we just uh, heard by Bernhard Hufenbach. Um, besides that, DLR also have own research facilities um, for, for space and uh, robotics and exploration. Um, so at these places, we are focusing on aspects we maybe not directly do together with the ESA or 
to prepare uh, technologies to later bring into international cooperation, either with the NISA or with our other international partners like NASA uh, and so on. Um, one of our key um, uh, topics, of course, uh, is robotics. Um, in uh, Munich, uh, in Oberpfaffenhofen, it's a very difficult to pronounce it, uh, little city close to Munich, uh, we have a, a large research center for uh, robotics. Um, um, and also in Bremen, uh, in the north of Germany, uh, we have another center for um, space uh, technology, space systems, um, where we also develop the Hayabusa uh, lander together with our French uh, colleagues. Um, what will give us the opportunity to not only concentrate the questions of next step in exploration on human activities, but also on robotics and how robotics and humans can work together in space, because this is, I think, uh, what is for certain, that we need a, a infrastructure that is capable to, to, um, to bring up the, 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 the best aspects of uh, humans in space and the best aspects of uh, robotics and make them work together for a uh, safe and sustainable infrastructure. Um, exploring Planets and uh, foreign moons uh, with robotics, I think, is for sure our next step, what, what, what's going on and what, what we are doing. Um, the bigger question, of course, is what's going to happen um, in low Earth orbit uh, and in, with the uh, human space flight in general. Uh, we heard before uh, that the, uh, the International Space Station uh, is now officially extended until 24. We all hope it will be extended uh, even further. Um, but certainly the ISS will be coming to an end. And we need uh, the awareness uh, also, and especially uh, within our uh, political um, decision-making uh, circles. We need the awareness that now is the time to, to take action, to think uh, about and, and to decide on, on where we want to go, to decide on our national interests, uh, but also to, to decide on international um, um, task sharing for, for the next steps. Um, and, the, and this is an aspect where DLA also uh, is, is promoting uh, ISS and human space flight a lot is maybe one of the driving forces with NISA or the ESA memberships, uh, member countries, um, that we, we need to do this now. Uh, and we hope that ISAF uh, 2 next year here in Japan uh, will be uh, a really a beacon uh, for, for this decision-making process. Um, and we hope that we, as a not so large uh, space nation like, like the Americans, but uh, of course that we can also bring our contribution into this and I think one key is that the contributions of all our countries need to be valuable and visible within our countries and within our uh, partnership framework so that the uh, decision makers in the end will agree to, to um, give us the budget we, we need. Um, and maybe I, I, I close, close here, um, but, but again, I think uh, we need, need to bring in all the small and large competences we have. and. Um, also maybe talk about partners which are not, not partners on the United, uh, the International Space Station right now, even though it might be difficult. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, I had a similar question to the uh, Mr. Pisani. And uh, you can uh, recently to agree to start uh, some feasibility study for the Moon and Mars exploration. Uh, so, what is your perspective to collaborate the uh, International Space Station with the future space exploration. Thank you very much. We have actually to consider one question. Why do we cooperate? Uh, probably to achieve a goal that we might not be able to achieve alone, or because if doing it together, the acceptance of it uh, will be increased. It takes a vision and that leadership role was taken in 1984 by President Reagan in uh, convincing friends and allies of the merit of a cooperation in space exploration. But it took 14 years to reach, and it will be a few weeks before the convening here in Japan of ISAF-2 in January 1998 that the IGA on the ISS was signed. That vision uh, 
in Europe was not a single vision. It was not a national project. That project was for all its member states embodied through ESA participation. And it is through ESA that we achieve a significant role in this space exploration. I have not mentioned the word CNES because as CNES is representing France in the European, European Space Agency, we involve more than CNES. We involve as well the scientific community. We involve research centers. And if I jump now to the mission which ended last Friday uh, with Thomas Pesquet, a European astronaut, and as Jan Werner might qualify it with a French accent, <laughs> we, um, we have conducted a number of scientific experiments on board the ISS, most of them in international cooperation as well. Uh, three years ago, uh, the partners of ISS have issued a book which is the second edition of Benefits for Humanity. Uh, I wonder whether a third edition might be ready on time for ISF2 in Tokyo. Uh, it, no, this was in 2015, and it was, fo it was a, um, a follow-up of uh, an ESA uh, publication in 2014, which highlighted the uh, research uh, and the benefits of ESA research on board the ISS. And this is something quite important. Uh, while speaking with that European astronaut uh, last Friday, uh, after its uh, soft landing, as we were just highlighted, uh, by the way, uh, the technique for uh, soft landing led to the airbags in our cars, um, by, by the way, to activate uh, a balloon to soften the, uh, the hard landing. Uh, the President of the French Republic uh, said, very simple word, you have over the last six months inspired us. And this is as well what the cooperation like the ISS should prove more and more, a source of inspiration, a source of technological innovation and uh, achieving uh, goals once again, we might not have been able to achieve alone. Okay, thank you very much. So next, uh, I'd like to ask uh, some the one uh, question that the, you know, the uh, uh, ISS is a good example, but uh, for the future exploration, we are more the partner to be involved, and also the destination is different, and uh, the mission is different. So just maybe it's a very difficult question, even to me, that the, what an efficient way to have the uh, good uh, co cooperation with uh, some different destination among the uh, some uh, possible partner. So, Kashi, do you have any uh, you I, I think the the lesson from the International Space Station, the the way that the the five agencies representing even more countries um, have been able to cooperate is is one that gives us confidence that we can, um, we can create uh, partnerships um, for the future. I think what you've, dis what you've seen is, um, you know, humans and robots will, will explore, and in many cases they will be exploring together. And so um, I don't, we don't think about the whole endeavor as one monolithic program, if you will. We think about it as a, as a, a number of different um, partnerships and collaborations to realize this vision and collaborations between agencies, between countries, collaborations with the, between agencies and the private sector. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, new agencies that are, are coming to the fold will bring, uh, will bring capabilities that can, can find a place in, in, in robotic and human missions. And, and, and hopefully there are, through, through the ISAG work, we're finding there are a number of agencies that are investing um, heavily in, in human space exploration technologies and, and will ultimately be part of a bigger core partnership of, of human agencies. So agencies like, um, like the Indians, like the Koreans, like the Chinese who have been mentioned. So there are uh, the, the UAE, um, United Arab Emirates is also 
um, uh, recently released a vision for, for Mars colonization in, mm. in the next century. But it's an example of the, the widespread interest in being part of a global exploration program. And, and I think um, there's a number of opportunities of how we can construct partnerships and collaborations. Okay. So we should have some many cooperation, including the China and so on. How do you think about this? Well, I think if you look at the situation today, indeed, we see a diverse range of partnerships. We have bilateral agency to agency collaboration, which are very successful. We have the ISS, which is probably the biggest multilateral cooperation we have, which is governed by a political governmental agreement. We have more and more commercial partnerships involving or not involving agencies. Now we see in future also philanthropic space, new actors. So if you look at in the future of exploration and all this ambitious plan of private sector and institutional players, I think we see a diversity of future partnership and every partnership which brings us forward helps. But I think there's one ultimate question, of course, you can ask. Um, we have a very stable international collaboration for the ISS now for uh, started already. We just taught the history lesson, but uh, it's a relatively long undertaking, and one, one reason why that was such a long undertaking was that it was governed, I think, by a political agreement, the so-called IGA. That has stabilized, I think, this partnership significantly, and it was necessary because partners who made significant investment in a range of billions required insurance that the investment would be protected because in this partnership, we are all dependent on each other. So if you think about the future and you think about a major future undertaking where you accept interdependency, the question becomes imminent, I think, whether we still see another intergovernmental agreement post-ISS and who would be the partners. I think when we look at exploration, it's certainly different than ISS because we have different partners. It's more flexible. We're not talking about single infrastructure. But I'm convinced that if we want to do something big together where we become interdependent, it's time to start reflecting on how we can get political engagement. And I'm looking forward to ISEF. I think we have a huge challenge here in Japan to host the next ISEF meeting. There are huge expectations. The process started in Europe uh, with, I think, the European Commission playing a key role. Uh, we had a successful meeting in Washington. I think so far this process has led to a situation where we have an increased awareness at political level about what the programs, plans, and roadmaps for exploration are how exploration benefits society. But the next meeting is key, I think, for me, the turning point, because what we have not yet understood, <laughs> some of us, how ISAF can create concrete value to the community. If I look at it from a European perspective, for us, value is if we get more political commitment and more investments. That hasn't happened so far yet, but we need it. Uh, so I think you have a very uh, challenging job to really transition ISAF into something which has a clear value proposition where we can measure impact and there are a number of big challenges which you could address at political level, including the question about governance, including the question how we can avoid having a number of big exploration initiatives which are strategically not aligned, so avoiding too much overlap. Uh, but it's a challenging activity, and I wish you good luck. Yeah. How, how about the private? Uh, okay, Cassie. Oh, the, um, the, the private sector. So uh, just a word on ISAF. I think the, the Japanese leadership in preparing for ISAF 2 is, is, is very important. And I think that if we can come out of that meeting with a set of, of, of common principles that, that organize how we're, going to, um, how we're going to proceed in forming the partnerships and a joint statement, a joint statement would be huge, um, a, a statement of intent from participating agencies, I think those would be um, huge steps forward. Um, on, on the private sector, you ask, um, how do we see the, the nature of these, these partnerships? You know, as you know, in the U.S., there's a lot of private, uh, private investment in, in, in human space flight over the last uh, five years or so. Um, some of it is companies that are, are, are looking to build a business plan and make money, and others are, are wealthy individuals that were uh, inspired by space when they were growing up and now have the ability to spend their own personal money on space-related endeavors. And each one of these, these are two separate potential types of partnerships for us, but each one um, presents very interesting opportunities to, um, to bring, uh, to leverage resources where we have common objectives and common goals. And we're, we're doing a lot to stimulate not only the partnerships that will make 
that will complete the economic development of low Earth orbit. So low Earth orbit will be a domain that's, that's dominated by, by the private sector and we as NASA can purchase the services that we need in low Earth orbit. Um, but we can focus our resources on, on, on exploration and, and the partnerships for exploration are, are in a number of areas. So um, communication and, and lunar robotic landers and, uh, and, and habitation related capabilities for, for, for the Gateway and Mars exploration. So we're pursuing a number of, of individual public-private partnerships and, and we see more on the horizon and, and um, are very excited by this, this new development. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So is there any additional comment on the, how we can consider the practice and efficient international cooperation with uh, many different players, government, private sector, and the space agency or non-space, some agency. Any additional comment? Okay. Okay. So, uh, as um, Kelsey and Bernardo mentioned that the, uh, some, uh, to introduce the ICEF2 is very key function to promote the uh, world international cooperation. I'll show some detail later. So we have uh, 10 minutes uh, remaining. Uh, is there any question from the floor? Please raise hand if you have any specific some technical question or how you can be involved in space exploration or anything. So please raise hand. Okay. The mic is uh, ongoing. Um, hello, my name is Volker Mara, DLR Bremen. <laughs> um, thanks for mentioning us. Um, my question is to um, Mrs. Laurini from NASA. You showed us a picture of the deep space transport and you mentioned already it's a very vague first impression. Um, there were large solar panels attached to the spacecraft. Is this already, let's say, a fixed uh, decision that it will be solar pro um, electrical and could it be also nuclear? So we're investing in um, nuclear propulsion, nuclear electric, nuclear thermal propulsion technologies. Um, what we envision is, is, is a hybrid system, if you will. So solar electric propulsion will, will definitely have a role, but there will be, um, there will be other, uh, other propulsion systems, uh, probably initially not, not nuclear-based, but as this, you know, as we... Um, you know, we're not talking about one single mission to Mars, to the surface of Mars. We're talking about a sustainable program with, with missions following. And so um, there's definitely um, on-ramps if, if nuclear propulsion can be, um, can be matured and ready. We think it's a, it's a huge enabler. Thank you very much. Okay. One more question. Do you have? Okay. Okay. Oh, well. Hello. Hello. Uh, Mike Tsai from USA. Um, I guess the question is for the whole panel. Uh, so I guess the China has been sort of uh, starting uh, their own space program and space stations. Do you see that as a more of a independently run program or are, are you actively engaging with China to, to seek cooperations in the front? <laughs> on, on, on the ESA side, uh, that's the nature of the European Space Agency. We do collaborate with everybody with whom we can uh, develop and establish meaningful partnership. We do actually work quite intensively with China, uh, with both organizations, the Chinese Main Space Administration, being in charge of the Human Spaceflight Program, but also Chinese National Space Administration, being more in charge of the Robotic Moon and Mars Exploration Program. We do understand their plans maybe also to their merge human robotic and start to develop our plans for, for human exploration beyond LEO. So we do try to establish really partnership. We have clear goals. We have the goal to get access to the Chinese space stations, fly European astronauts out there, get, perform joint science. We also see whether we can leverage and coordinate our robotic missions for the moon. Um, clearly, I think on the, on the either side, we are reaching out to various partners. Uh, we would welcome 
if there would be discussions. Looking at the challenge ahead of us, if you seriously want to explore sustainably, it's a huge challenge. And speaking from the International Space Exploration Coordination point of view, we know we need to all work together if we want to make it sustainable. So we would wish and welcome if there would be more strategic discussion and dialogue at different levels and maybe even integration of all those programs if we share common goals to sustainably explore beyond low Earth orbit. And we do think that these kind of discussion require political mandate, of course. So we would very much welcome if there would be more integration. Any comments? Okay. I'll, oh. I'll just add, um, you know, it, it's well known that we have some limitations on the U.S. side at engaging with the Chinese, um, but there are mechanisms that we can talk to them, um, multilateral mechanisms such as the ISEG, and we do have some bilateral discussions on the science level um, going on. I think the more we, we learn about their programs and their goals, they're very focused on establishing their own Chinese capabilities right now, and, and, uh, and, and less so, less interested in, in talking with us about a, about a common future. I, I, I anticipate that will change as, as, as things go forward. As Bernard says, um, it's, it's something that's gonna take all of us, this space exploration, to, to succeed. So um, we'll see what the future holds. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So please show the, uh, my last chart on the screen. Okay, as I mentioned, that uh, March 3rd next year, uh, we, uh, Japanese government will host the uh, uh, second International Space Exploration Hall Forum. Uh, the first one was uh, held in the United States in 2014, that the, uh, some, we have the 35 the countries, a ministerial level uh, representative, and we now, uh, we uh, common we have some common goal for the some uh, uh, the human uh, exploration to the Mars, and right now so second uh, ISAF two that we like to discuss more some concrete idea or some uh, how we can collaborate uh, towards some uh, Moon and Mars with some dedicated the. Uh, some partnership. And uh, also we have some side event uh, in conjunction with the uh, ISAF2 main session uh, to invite the more industries and universities and uh, researcher in the young generation. And uh, we have our uh, JAXA promoting some the two side event. First one is uh, industry the ISAF program to invite the, uh, some many the representative from the private sector to provide some opportunity for the networking among the space exploration the expert and uh, also share the, some the uh, view of the some uh, space business some perspective the how they can invest the some uh, our uh, international the program, and also generate some the excitement, the enthusiasm about, about the space exploration. So we like to invite the uh, many some the uh, company from the worldwide in uh, in charge the some uh, space exploration program uh, by the space technology and non-space technology. And also, we will have the Young ISAF program. The, it's, uh, you know, uh, space exploration itself is the long journey to next uh, maybe 20 years or 30 years and so long. So the uh, young generation should be more uh, aggressively involved. So we like to gather the uh, 80 or 100 young professionals from the uh, around the world to in the various activities. So we will compose some team activities to define their opinion, own opinion on how they can be involved in the uh, space exploration program. So uh, we will uh, now the, uh, invite everybody in the program and also the, uh, anybody through the uh, internet broadcasting program today 
to I like to encourage uh, every young uh, professor to join this uh, activity to make uh, you own some vision and you own some you know uh, dream for their space exploration. In the sense of so for last closing remarks, I like to all the panelists to uh, send some message to the young generation for the future exploration. So, Cassie, please, go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, uh, governments invest in space exploration to benefit people on Earth. Um, one important benefit is global cooperation and understanding in the strategic domain of space. So what I want to do is encourage all the young people that are here today and are participating on the internet to, to make contacts, make relationships with your counterparts around the world. Um, these, these collaboration, these relationships are so important and um, will help us to address the challenges ahead. Thank you. Well, space exploration, I think, started maybe a bit more than 50 years ago. We're just in the very beginning. I think there's a huge challenge to extend human presence beyond Earth and beyond low Earth orbit in sustainable fashion. It's a very exciting journey. I think I joined it 26 years ago. I still enjoy every day of work. And I think you've made the right choice. Stay connected to space exploration. We'll have a great career and a great future. I think the, the space exploration, uh, actually the, for the moon exploration and the Mars exploration will be the 2030 or 2040. Uh, it's not time for, for the panelist members. <laughs> And uh, young people are the main actor uh, for the 2030 or 2040. Uh, so the, uh, and also the, you are the candidate uh, of the astronaut to, to the moon or Mars. So be ambitious to the, uh, that astronaut be, uh, being astronaut or prepared for the space exploration. So my, my, my advice uh, would, would be maybe something that what our DG of ESA, former uh, DLR uh, um, chairman, would have given you, ask disruptive questions. Don't, don't just take it for, 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 for set what, what the governmental organizations do or what the private sector is doing. Ask, is this really the right way? Are there other ways to go? Um, may, maybe there is a longer but maybe more efficient way in the end to, to reach a goal. So just think around the edges and uh, be curious and uh, yeah, um, build up your international networks and discuss new ideas, what might not have been arisen uh, within the international community so far. This is, I think, the chance and also the right of the young uh, generation to think differently and um, to give a, a new spirit into a already five, 50 years old endeavor called space. Um, in order to answer in a very concrete way what uh, Miyake-san just said, how can we focus and uh, give attention to ICEF2 for young people? Uh, probably what I will try to do is not to focus on the young professionals, because those ones are already recruited by employers to work in a space-related sector. Um, I would just go one step uh, under uh, or before that with high school students. And uh, I know that at CNES, as in other space agencies, we have through our public affairs and communication directorate already um, solutions in place. So we should tap on those resources to uh, make a sort of competition among schools uh, and what we call in French lycée uh, to attract it. And why not to start um, with uh, one close to my office, which is the French school in Tokyo. Thank you. This is what we will discuss further to see if it meets JAXA and MEXT objectives. Okay, thank you. So for, for my closing remarks, uh, actually the, for myself, <coughs> for myself the, uh, almost 35 years ago, when I, I entered the uh, previous NASA, the uh, just space station program just started to by the only two persons, one senior person and myself. Uh, it's a very exciting, uh, it was very exciting moment for me to uh, work with such a new uh, international cooperation. So I hope the, uh, it's you, Tana, so every 
uh, young people students uh, can, could, could possible to uh, participate this very exciting and challenging the program. So I like to encourage everybody to work for that. So thank you very much for the participation. So please approve, approve the uh, three times. So I'd like to adjourn this session. So thank you very much for your attention.